this is a story about money, how billions and billions of pounds simply disappeared during the credit crunch because of mistakes made by the banks, and about how we, the taxpayers, every person in Britain had to bail those banks out. And it's also the story of a group of MPs, the House of Commons Treasury Select Committee, about how during two years of hearings into the credit crunch, they were the ones who got to ask the questions every taxpayer in Britain wanted answered. The masters, or ex-masters of the universe who'd led their banks to disaster, weren't keen to come out of the stratosphere and talk to the media to explain themselves, but Commons committees won't take no for an answer. Ultimately, they can force witnesses to attend. As banks and building societies imploded one by one, more and more witnesses were summoned to these committee rooms to explain what had happened. And this is the story, well, just a few highlights really, of what those titans of industry and politics and economics told the one forum that could hold them to account in public. Mr Marino, come on, give us a break. What caused this? That Savers did not trust any of you. These events began in a faraway housing market of which we know nothing, so-called subprime mortgages, high-risk loans to low-income borrowers in America, were sold to banks around the world. And quite suddenly, when the US economy slowed, the markets realised that billions of dollars worth of these mortgages were all but worthless. What had looked like solid assets evaporated in the twinkling of an eye, lending from bank to bank dried up because no one was sure which would survive. And for one particular British bank, that turned into a death sentence. Good evening. One of Britain's biggest mortgage lenders, Northern Rock, is applying to the Bank of England for emergency financial support. Our business editor, Robert Peston, has this exclusive report. Northern Rock has been one of the fastest growing British banks. But it's now set to become famous for reasons it would rather keep quiet. It's become the first bank in years to seek emergency funding from the Bank of England in its role as lender of last resort. When you've got your life savings invested, you want to be sure that they're safe, don't you? Well, if they're not in trouble, why are they having to borrow from the government? Nobody's given an absolute guarantee that the money is safe in this bank. It was a sight that hadn't been seen in Britain for more than a century, a run on a bank that affected every voter and therefore every MP. Here we were in modern Britain with our so-called sophisticated financial markets and we had people queuing around the block like those grainy pictures from the 30s. We were completely shocked. I was shocked. Uh, we'd never seen anything like this. Who is next? Is it going to be another bank? Is it going to be a bank run? As the government moved to bail out Northern Rock to shore up the whole banking system, the Treasury Committee decided to investigate. It's made up of 14 MPs representing the three main parties. It's supposed to monitor the government's handling of the economy on behalf of Parliament. And these are some of the main players. John McFall's been chairman since 2001. Before politics, he was a deputy headmaster. At Westminster, he became a whip and then a minister. He's a visiting professor at Strathclyde University's business school. Michael Fallon's the committee's highest profile conservative. A former minister, he's tipped to inherit the chair of the committee if the Tories win the next election. The Liberal Democrat John Thurso is an old Etonian and a former CEO of Champneys Health Spas. Uniquely, he sat in the House of Lords as a hereditary peer before he was elected to the Commons. Northern Rock had been bailed out by the government and its depositors had their money guaranteed by the taxpayer. Nationalisation was to follow. The architect of Northern Rock's controversial mortgage lending strategy was Chief Executive Adam Applegarth. The crew running Northern Rock clearly didn't understand properly the risk of their bus business model. They seemed quite baffled to have been caught out by the closure of the financial markets. It was certainly a session where we felt that the corporate governance in Northern Rock uh, was very poor. The fundamental cause was the uh, speed and duration uh, and the global nature of the liquidity freeze um, heightened for us by the fact that we didn't have access to the same type of borrowing facilities that have been available for uh, American banks from the so US. There was Federal nothing Reserve you could have done to mitigate this risk. Um, 
No. No action you could have taken that could have mitigated this risk? No. They had this set of phrases about how it was an unforeseeable uh, circumstance that they were in. And as it went on, I got crosser and crosser because we were clearly being stonewalled. We keep Not saying it was <laughs> unforeseen, yet this committee had been discussing it for six months. We discussed it when we were in America. We discussed it in open session. Lots of people were talking about the risks that were coming. Why was nobody, is nobody else in this crisis? Why, why are you the only ones and why is it so unreasonable? Well, uh, I don't think we're the only ones, as evidenced by the number of banks who had to approach the ECB for exactly the same type of borrowing facility, i.e. Yeah, but they're the only ones that have completed... The, none of them have lost their brand. None of them are up for sale. Uh, none of them uh, are frankly destroyed by what's happened. You're the only real serious casualty. Was well, the only serious casualty then. And banks like Northern Rock were lending 125% of your value on self-certified income without even any sample checks on whether the salary you'd put down was actually what you were earning. Uh, that was highly, highly irresponsible. In addition, several of the so-called mortgage banks like Northern Rock of course, were uh, borrowing a very, very large, large proportion of what they were lending from the wholesale markets rather than from their own uh, depositors. Uh, they weren't running a proper deposit base. And should the Rock's chairman, uh, Matt Ridley, uh, better known as a science writer than as a banker, have stopped its risky lending strategy? Uh, there was a chairman who was conceding the patch to the chief executive, and that highlighted the lack of corporate governance as one of the major issues contributing to this crisis. Have none of the board any sense of honour? Has nobody offered to resign? Um, I uh, uh, would like at this point perhaps to suggest that Sir Ian Gibson answers that question. No, I think you answered it, Dr Ridley, that's why you're here. Yes, indeed. Okay. I, I was going to say, but I will, I will give a quick answer to it first. I've made it clear to the senior independent director, as is his role, that my resignation is available to him um, uh, as soon as uh, he thinks it's in the interests of the company, its shareholders, creditors, uh, employees and other stakeholders uh, that I go. And he resigned two days later. And what about the regulators whose job was to prevent banks taking dangerous risks to keep the financial system stable? They're the so-called tripartite, the Treasury, the Bank of England and the Financial Services Authority, a triple-headed system established by the then-Chancellor Gordon Brown more than ten years ago. They were working under rules set out in a memorandum of understanding. But had they failed at their first big test? In terms of the tripartite authority, we had the Governor of the Bank, the Chief Executive Chairman of the FSA and the Chancellor Exchequer coming along and I asked them all, did you do, do your job? And more or less they said handsomely they did your job. Well, if they did their job, you know, why was there such a screw up? The Governor of the Bank of England, Mervyn King, a former economics professor, was the first to give evidence just days after the rocks collapse. He was a veteran of many a financial crisis in the city, so why, the MPs wondered, had efforts to save Northern Rock resulted in unprecedented panic. Well, let, let, let me ask a question, if you like, what the ordinary person in the streets asking the Governor is this. You know, how do we get a situation where the effort put in to rescue Northern Rock is the equivalent of screaming fire in a crowded and darkened cinema. Everybody rushes for the door and there's sheer and absolute panic, all as a result of one company maybe having a bad business model. The governor revealed the bank Second had wanted to act behind the scenes to avoid alarming the public, but his hands had been tied by the law. And the way that I would have wanted to do it on this occasion is to have acted covertly as lender of last resort, to have lent to Northern Rock without immediately publishing that fact, publishing it after the operation had been over, so that you and others could hold us accountable for the operation itself. As a result of the Market Abuses Directive in 2005, we were unable to carry out a covert lender of last resort operation in the way that we would have done in the 1990s. And who amongst the three regulators, the bank, the treasury and the FSA or Financial Services Authority, who was actually in control? 
I asked him who was in charge, and famously he said, well, define what you mean by in charge. And I think that actually told you why people were queuing around the block, because they were getting information from too many different sources. The governor saying there was no need to panic, the chairman of the Financial Services Authority saying something else, and then the chancellor saying a third thing altogether. And I think it was clear to everybody that really um, this was a mess. The FSA said it was solvent, but they can't intervene in the markets. The Chancellor then guarantees the deposits. Who is actually in charge? Well, I think those different actions are all important, and they all go to the responsibilities. This would have been no different without the Memorandum yes. of Understanding. Yes. The Memorandum Chancellor of Understanding. Who is in charge? Well, what do you mean by in charge? Well, would you like to define that? What our constituents want to know, given this mess, who is in charge the of The Who is responsible? Well, we are each responsible for the various re responsibilities that we've been given under the MOU. The final decision on whether to put taxpayers' money at risk obviously belongs with the Chancellor. You would expect that. I don't have the authority to put taxpayers' money at risk. The responsibility for the design of the operations in markets that we carry out is our responsibility at the bank, and the judgment about individual institutions is that of the FSA. But at that stage, we weren't aware of what was still to come, and that it was far deeper, it was systemic, and that the whole system was going to end up coming down. The committee was highly sceptical of the system of regulation and it was about to come under even more scrutiny. As their inquiries into the rock continued in the summer of 2008, the next credit crunch dominoes were about to fall. Good evening. It's been a day of turmoil on the world's money markets after the collapse of Lehman Brothers, one of America's biggest investment banks. Alan Greenspan, the former head of the US Federal Reserve, called it a once-in-a-century event. It's 8 o'clock on Monday the 29th of September. The headlines this morning. The government's confirmed it's nationalising Bradford and Bingley. Its savings business is being sold to the Spanish group Santander. It's 7 o'clock on Wednesday the 8th of October. Only one main headline today. The government is announcing that it's using up to £50 billion of taxpayers' money partly nationalised Britain's leading bank. In the last few seconds, the Chancellor of the Exchequer has issued a statement which will, he hopes, rescue Britain's banks. It's 8 o'clock on Monday the 13th of October. £37 billion pounds of taxpayers' money is being pumped into three of our biggest banks. The government will have a majority stake in the Royal Bank of Scotland. Senior directors have been told they won't receive cash bonuses this year. After 10 years of a strong economy, the Chancellor, Alistair Darling, had arrived at the Treasury just as the credit crunch hit. Now, as one leg of the tripartite, he was having to defend the system his Prime Minister had set up. I've been asked about this on Well, I'm the Chancellor, and with me we have the Governor and the Chairman of the FSA. He appeared before the committee for a unique hearing alongside the other heads of the tripartite. There'd already been a row in Parliament over the steps he'd taken. With the government's and the Prime Minister's personal credibility at issue, the political as well as the economic stakes were huge. Uh, we have had to take a number of steps that in past years we might have thought to be extraordinary, like the nationalisation of Northern Rock uh, at the beginning of this year. And you recall that even within Parliament that was deeply controversial at the time. Nationalising a high street bank is not the way to begin and we will oppose it tomorrow. Yeah. We had a similar uh, problem with Bradford and Bingley in September. And ten days ago we had to deal with the problems at Bradford and Bingley. We transferred the savings business, the branches and the related jobs to Abbey Santander, protecting savers, and took the rest of the company into public ownership. And of course, uh, since September, uh, since uh, the collapse of Lehman Brothers in the United States, the problem became acute. Until markets stabilise, the Bank of England will extend and widen its injections of funds into the system to build on the, th on the £40 billion it put in yesterday. That's why it was necessary for us uh, at the beginning of October to announce that we were going to embark on a major programme to help our banks recapitalise, to build up their strength so that we would be able to continue to lend to each other, to businesses and to people. Well, Alistair Darling was most unfortunate as a Chancellor in taking up the post and facing the biggest financial crisis 
that we've had. He got off to an extremely shaky start and the whole of his first year as Chancellor he looked as if uh, it was all going on around him and I, to be frank, I really wondered whether he was coping. I've always thought he's a very good parliamentary performer. You, he's almost impossible to rile. Um, he's always very calm. Um, he's always very patient. And I think uh, probably over the piece his, his stature has grown. You and Mr Brown were in overall charge of all this. I mean, why don't you accept responsibility and say sorry? But I've said to you that I accept responsibility for everything that I'm responsible for. But in, but in relation to what has been happening in the banking system overall, you know, I, I think there are several levels of responsibility. Yes, in our national regulators. Undoubtedly, we needed to toughen up what was happening internationally. There's another area which we overlook at our peril, and that is the responsibility of boards of banks who are supposed to be the first line of defence in relation to their own yeah. institution. At the Financial Services Authority, Lord Turner was appointed chairman just as the banks were being buffeted by the storms. A former director of the CBI and a polished technocrat, Lord Turner underlined that it wasn't just the UK authorities that had been caught out. I think, to be honest, it is an admission that at the level of the whole world there was a failure to see enormous risks developing in our financial system. But in a later hearing, Lord Turner was explicitly critical of the system. It fairly overtly said that it was not the function of the regulator to, ca to cast questions over the overall business strategy of the institution. Now, you may find that surprising, and I think with hindsight, I find it surprising, but that is the case. And I think it is also the case that that existed within a political philosophy where all the pressure on the FSA was not to say, are you looking more closely at these business models, but to say, why are you being so heavy and intrusive? Can't you make your regulation a bit more light touch? But it wasn't supposed to be like this. It was supposed to be this perfectly owned piece of machinery that uh, swung into action when whenever there was any crisis and everybody was supposed to liaise with everybody else. But it was clear that nobody was in overall charge and uh, there was no real mechanism for who should decide and under what circumstances that there was real systemic risk and how a rescue operation should be mounted. The committee now turned its attention to the managers of two huge banks which had collapsed. RBS, the Royal Bank of Scotland, and HBOS, Halifax Bank of Scotland, had both been nationalised at vast cost to the taxpayer. And as the committee prepared to hear from the managers who had been in charge of those institutions, public and media interest rose to fever pitch. Well, it starts even before you get here. You come down the corridor, it's full of press, there's masses of public, there's the witnesses nervously chewing their nails and you come in and we have our private meeting you're aware of all that's been written the day before uh, the chairman calls for the public and the witnesses to be um, let in there's a scramble for seats the place is absolutely packed cameras on scribes in every corner with notebooks out Lloyds, H Boss, Royal Bank of Scotland, Barclays? I, hang on What's I, left? I'm on planet reality. Former Conservative MP itself. and Treasury Minister so Angela Knight is a practised witness at select committees and she's now the spokesman for the banking industry. This is, this is real adversarial stuff, you know, you've got um, uh, the crowd cheering on one side, you know, you've got the gladiators, you've got, uh, you know, you're in the bear pit, it's all that type of, type of environment. And so it did become pretty compulsive. Well, the public clearly wanted to know how um, these major British institutions had come to the point of collapse and wanted to know why so much public money had had to be put into them when they had these apparently very respectable high-powered boards of directors and uh, were boasting that they were world-class uh, financial institutions and I think people just couldn't understand how they'd got into so much trouble. So that was what was unique about the session. It was really the first chance to confront these people right at the top and say, how on earth did this sort of thing happen? Can you introduce yourselves, please, starting with Lord Stevenson? The most famous of the four in tabloid terms was Sir Fred Goodwin, known as Fred the Shred because of his ferocious cost-cutting. He had overseen the rapid expansion of RBS and its even faster collapse. 
the MPs had sharpened their sound bites. But a lot of the press previous to the report hearings was stating that they were going to apologise. So the first question obviously was... Is sorry the hardest part? We are profoundly, and I think I would say unreservedly sorry, at the turn of events. In November of last year, I made a, a full apology, unreserved apology, both personally and on behalf of the board, uh, and I'm very happy to repeat that this morning. I apologised in full and I'm happy to do so again at the public meeting of our shareholders back in November. Um, and I, I too would echo uh, Dennis Stevenson's comments and uh, Tom's comments that uh, there is a profound and unqualified apology for all of the distress that has been caused. Uh, we deliberately started our written submission with a full and frank apology. I'm very sorry what's happened at HBOS. It has affected shareholders, many of whom are colleagues. It's affected the communities in which we live and serve. It's clearly affected taxpayers. And we are extremely sorry for, for the turn of events that's brought it about. Anne Treneman was watching from the sidelines in her role as parliamentary sketch writer for The Times. They weren't really sure what they were sorry for. They were sorry that things had gone badly wrong. But, you know, the fact that something like RBS, which is, you know, we'd have to, we have, we have had to pay for all, you know, the taxpayers paid this incredible amount of money over to pick up the pieces that these four men had let slip through their fingers in the most incredible way. And they just didn't quite seem to get that. They didn't quite seem to get that every person in Britain was paying for their mistakes. The apology was a general apology for the situation in which businesses in the country found themselves rather than a personal apology. And I think that's where the story unwound for them and the public anger and frustration I think is built up as a result of that situation because no one was taking personal responsibility for the situation in which companies found themselves in. Companies which incidentally had a balance sheet bigger than the GEP of the United Kingdom. If cards have gone slightly differently, if there could have been others here rather than you facing the music, or whether you're <coughs> particularly personally culpable. Oh, I don't feel I am particularly personally culpable. No, well, thank you. Um, Sir, Sir Fred Goodwin, I mean, how much worse could it have been at RBS if you hadn't been in charge? <laughs> well, I think um, I fully accept my responsibility. It was post Lehman's that the collapse in confidence, the collapse in markets just came round and hit us, and we were caught at that point. Um, it was very sudden and very sharp. Could it have you happened see, to see, others? You see, I, I, I keep hearing about the requirement for, for brilliance. We need to attract, and people come telling us, telling me all the time, we need to attract the most brilliant. Um, other people out there who are more brilliant who could have done a better job than you with RBS? I, there may well be. It would seem unreasonable for me to conclude that there weren't. We have, I suppose, a, a longer tradition in the UK of uh, putting people in the stocks in the middle of villages and throwing tomatoes at them. But the reality of something like the difficulties here, the credit crunch that is, and I keep on saying this and will continue to say it, is a global matter. You know, how we actually deal with it, I think, has to be a little bit better, if I may say. Do, do you think your industry has been demonised by these hearings? Well, of course it's been demonised. I mean, there, and there are problems. I mean, uh, I'm not pretending that the, the industry was perfect. Of course it wasn't. Of course it wasn't. But the majority of the banks are actually managing quite well. So, Fred, I think in 2007 your remuneration was uh, 4.1 million or, or thereabouts, of which about two thirds was in the form of bonus. Uh, Mr. Hornby, I think the figure for you was about 1.9 million, about half of which was bonus. Can you tell us, please, what those figures would be for 2008? Well, I've got no, there's no bonus being paid for 2008. And total like, remuneration? Uh, my salary for 2008 would be uh, 1.46 million. I, there will be no bonus at all payable for 2008. Clearly my, my salary um, was roughly in line with the previous year. I have to say 99% of my constituents feel that if a great black hole opened up and every merchant banker in the world and arbitrage trader and credit derivative inventor disappeared down it, the world would be a better place and could we be get back to Captain Mannering running a bank we could trust? Well, I recognise that sentiment. <laughs> Thank you. I, so what I'm concerned about, actually, and I think it was referenced by a number of other members here, that yeah. it's, just, it's just too simple if you want to blame it all on me. Yeah. 
you want to blame it all on me and close the book, that'll get the job done very quickly, but it does not go anywhere close to no, no, I, the cause I, I, no. The MPs and the rest of the country were startled to learn that Sir Fred Goodwin had held on to his pension of £700,000 a year. At a later hearing, the committee asked the recently appointed and some thought politically inexperienced city minister, Lord Miners, why the government had allowed that to happen. If Fred's agreement is watertight, then he can do nothing at all. And he's out the trap with a clean pair of heels and he's really left the government flat-footed. That's the summation of it. Well, um, I think one has to uh, admire in a non-approving sense the dexterity of Sir Fred Goodwin in respect of his own contract. Because You've left me with the thought that you admire Sir Fred's dexterity but at the end of the day, it's a taxpayer that's a bloody mug here. Yes, I, I, and I was very careful to say what I did not approve. Sir Fred later gave some of his pension back, but that was just one of the occasions when the chairman's exasperation showed. Those hearings are part about performance, and MPs are looking for cooperation, as those who've given evidence know well. It's not something that you just uh, uh, breeze into without thinking. Uh, without doing, you know, your own uh, revision, your own homework, you're getting your own ideas uh, lined up first. You do need to do that. Not only are you surrounded by this sort of inquisition, all these interrogators, you're flanked by journalists and uh, sketch writers, and you know that quite a lot of them um, are just desperate for you to make a complete fool of yourself. A classic example was that of John Kingman, the former Treasury civil servant, who became head of UKFI, the holding company which controlled an impressive list of nationalised banks. He'd failed to arm himself with the facts and figures the committee asked for. How many staff at each of RBS, Lloyds Banking Group, Northern Rock and Bradford and Bingley were paid more than £100,000 in 2008? Uh, I don't have that figure available, I'm afraid. Could you send up those precise details to us? You can certainly ask the banks. Okay, so how many staff at each of the four firms received bonuses, bonuses in cash and shares combined in 2008 greater than £100,000 and £1 million? Uh, again, we do not have those figures. Uh, we can ask the banks whether they uh, wish to disclose those figures. Mm -hmm. Did you contact these individual companies and ask for that information? No. Is it worth getting on with this session? They're not easy. They're not designed to be easy. And I think sometimes people do find them immensely intimidating, frankly. We were briefed on a number of broad areas we expected the committee to ask. I had not understood that there was a specific request to ask the banks for this information. We are happy to ask them whether they're willing to provide that information. The clerk is telling me that you were phoned on Friday and asked specifically. Well, I apologise. That, mes that message certainly had not reached me with that clarity, and I apologise. Well, I think that's scandalous, to be quite honest with you. And I think it's a bad start for UKFI. The MPs ended up conducting several parallel inquiries into what was by now a multifaceted crisis, not just on the fall of individual banks, but on the crisis as a whole. The UK was in recession and the government had sought to boost the economy with massive injections of cash, what economists call a fiscal stimulus. The hearings gave a platform to some key witnesses. Looking back, perhaps the single most important contribution came from the Governor of the Bank of England, whose style baffled some but clearly endeared him to others. I like Mervyn. I mean, I, I think he's a class act. And he uses us in the best sense extremely well. And I think it's a very fruitful relationship that has developed. The first couple of times I sketched Mervyn King, I found it very difficult because he is very sort of shifty is the wrong word. He's incredibly sort of academic and gnomic. He also picks his, word with, his words with exquisite care. They are said extremely softly and you don't realise he's let off a bomb until you've gone out and sort of really taken on board um, what he's said. He talks about the unconventional unconventionals as opposed to the conventional unconventionals. And, and then at one point he says, what well, they're saying about savers, you know, what are we going to do about savers? Where, and he said, I call that the paradox of policy. I mean, it means absolutely nothing to anyone, really, except Mervyn King, possibly. 
Well, I think this goes back to what I call the paradox of policy, and that's what I call the unconventional, unconventional purchases. But then the other operation, what I call the conventional, unconventional purchases, is about a relatively standard use of for the central bank, which is to buy government gilts in the secondary market. But the moment came when everyone understood. The governor gave an emphatic warning about the dangers of the government taking on too much more debt. Well, I think it was an important moment because there was a debate within government at the time about a second fiscal stimulus and Mervyn King's comments brought that debate up sharply and I think it had an implication in government policy. A bit of a thunderclap over Whitehall. It was. Mervyn King delivered it you know, very, very smoothly and quietly in the committee, but I think it did have that thunderclap effect. We are going to have to accept for the next two to three years very large fiscal deficits. But given how big those deficits are, I think it would be sensible to be cautious about going further in using discretionary measures to expand the size of those deficits. That, that's not to rule out targeted and selective measures that may find those areas, whether it's in the labour market, whether it's in corporate credit, that can do some good. But I think you know, we, at the level of the, the fiscal position in the UK is not one that would say, well, why don't we just engage in another significant round of fiscal expansion? I mean, I actually had a sharp intake of breath, you know. I mean, because, you know, he knew exactly what he was doing. He had timed it perfectly. And he says it in this little voice as if he's saying nothing. And, you know, markets are falling. <laughs> and, of course, we'd moved on by the time everybody was say, saying... I could, you could see the faces around the table sort of going, did I hear that right? I must check the transcript later, you know. Um, and it was... And it, it, so it, it, it became obvious just how big it was as time kind of went by. It was described as uh, cutting up the uh, Chancellor's credit card. And uh, I think it did have a constraining effect. I think the public perhaps uh, began to realise for the first time just how dire our financial, our financial uh, position actually is now. One important issue was the role of the press. Had the media, by publicising Northern Rock's difficulties, caused the stampede of depositors to withdraw their cash? The story of the impending government bailout had been broken by Robert Peston, the ex-Financial Times journalist who'd recently become the BBC's business editor. Northern Rock made him into a household name. Fear has been stalking the markets for weeks now. And frankly, if an institution of this sort got into really serious financial difficulties, well, heaven alone knows what impact that would have had on confidence in other banks, what it would have done to the stock market, and so on. But did the very act of breaking that story ultimately doom Northern Rock. Is it a case for journalists to exercise self-restraint and temporarily delay publication of a story, perhaps for a few hours or a day or two, where there is a risk that immediate publication would trigger widespread market turbulence or lead to the collapse of a particular institution? Robert. Wow. Well, um, sorry, I just picked you around. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I mean, at the sort of risk of sounding slightly pompous and pretentious, uh, it does seem to be there is a... Go on. Uh, Go on. There, there, is, there is a public interest in you know, letting millions of people know what's going on with their banks and what's going on with the economy. And if their banks are you know, weaker than they think to be the case, then there's a public interest in telling them such. I think there is something about all that history uh, you know, a bit of a cliche, the majesty of Parliament, that actually when you get there, um, I mean, you know, I did feel, uh, it was my first appearance, I don't, I, you know, and, 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 and um, I think I did feel more nervous than I expected. We never had the journalists along to blame them for the situation. That would have been absolutely absurd. Uh, so what we were looking at was for a deeper understanding of the crisis and how the press reported that. One by one, they all claimed to have seen it earlier. It's a bit like Paris in 1946. You know, they were all in the resistance then. Um, but e even even these these claims that they'd spotted earlier than anybody else, of course, were all buried away in inside uh, large property supplements that told you you were, you were making a mistake if you weren't buying six buy-to-let flats in Belgrade. I mean, they were all part of this uh, asset price bubble, and I don't think enough of them actually warned us against that at the time. This was a story that I've been following in some ways for years, actually. In 2003, I first identified 
Northern Rock as a, bunk, a bank whose business model I was a little bit concerned about. It seemed to me it was going far too fast. I wrote about it in the Sunday Telegraph. Uh, and for years, I looked like a bit of a plonker because the share price went up and up and up. And uh, the fact that I'd said I you know, uh, thought this may be uh, uh, you know, uh, heading towards some kind of an accident you know, looked wrong. I looked like an idiot. Gillian Tett, certainly in a column written the day after Northern Rock received some, in, ret in retrospect, worthless city banking award for being the best bank of the year, actually wrote a column raising serious questions about the business model of Northern Rock. But that's not the same as saying Northern Rock is in trouble, the shares will go down, it may go bankrupt. I can assure you the, 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 the writ would have been on my desk the next day. We, would, we couldn't do that. And one of the things we learned is that, that how sharp the journalists were in comparison to the committee. And you kind of wish they were turning the tables and that, that Robert Peston was sitting where John McFall was and that he was querying the committee saying, well, why didn't you do this? Why did you do that? And um, one of the journalists actually did say, well, you know, you're asking us, why didn't we know? Well, why didn't you know? Everybody has been taken completely by storm, if not by surprise, by this. I don't think anybody comes out with clean fingers. Um, uh, you know, we could just ask the same questions you're asking of us, uh, of you. And what have you been doing all this time? Um, uh, the answer is, we really didn't know the full force of what was about to be unleashed on us. And that's the truth of the matter. The credit crunch is going to be with us for years, probably decades to come. It'll be in our pensions, our public services, our tax bills, our job prospects. And having heard from the governors of the Bank of England, the powerful ministers, the bankers, the industry regulators, how did the Treasury Committee itself perform? Well, they issued a whole series of very weighty reports full of detailed recommendations on the future of the banking industry. And more than that, they fulfilled a different function. A kind of rough justice was dispensed here. Some said it was the modern equivalent of the pillory, or maybe the stocks. People were beginning to suffer in their daily lives. Uh, people were extremely worried and people were getting very cross about some of the things they were learning and they jolly well wanted to know more. And there we were, available on live television. Uh, and therefore I think we played a very important part in connecting the public with the events. The committee was getting to an interesting place where they had much more confidence. They had much more kind of feeling of their own mission than they've ever had before. And I think, you know, it really gave you an idea of, the, of how, that select committees could be much more powerful than they are. I mean, they need to have some confidence too. Look, every now and then I'd be watching a session and I'd be saying, why don't you ask this question? Or, you know, every, you know and you'd get sort of slightly frustrated that, you know, perhaps, you know, the killer blow wasn't landed or a particular follow-up was somehow missed. But I'd say they were the exception to the rule. You can't expect a committee not to grandstand from time to time. After all, it's going to, isn't it? You know, and to a certain extent, that's what it's there for. It's there to call people to account. I had friends in the city who were watching it on various channels who would kind of hush the dealing room and turn the sound up when we came on. So you're telling me here, though, in answer to question, Governor, they're not execs. We can't even hope for them to do their job. They're just no, I'm, not saying that at all. I'm not saying that at all. So what I'm saying is... What, what I am saying is that the question you've asked is one that was asked in the past, and the fact that there is a crisis is in itself not evidence that the individuals in charge of those institutions necessarily yeah. failed. But Governor, this is, this is 2008, we've put £500 million into the banks, we've got 5,000 emails from people who are angry about these things, and you're telling us, look, look, things are going to go on as they are. The power of the executive over years has been increasing, and we have to rebalance that power and I think we're finding that newfound power in the select committee rooms. You and nobody else has any guarantee or any solution that will lead you to a position but that, Governor, you sure that there never will be a crisis. To give us an idea of the way forward. We have and I've every, all, all the way through Well this tell process. us other than I will see this again in 20 years time. I will give tell us some you comfort. Right. Exactly and ever since I came to this committee first uh, back in last September, I have spelled out for you exactly the direction in which you should go, and I'm glad to say you've listened. <laughs>